Bonjour. Good afternoon and welcome to this ninth session. My name is Pascal Richer. I'm a journalist at uh, LOPS. I'm very pleased to moderate this roundtable devoted to the dangers of debt. I'm wondering why there's no question mark, because in, is debt dangerous? I'm not certain it is. It's true that it has reached summits. We're more or less at the level of uh, just after the Second World War at the moment. But it is useful for many reasons. First of all, it helps to soften impacts and crises. And uh, we need to invest in the future as well, so it can be used for that too. We're going to talk about these subjects. What is excessive debt? And above all, who is going to pay or cancel that debt? We have a very diverse panel. We have uh, Sarah Carlson, who is Senior Vice President of the uh, Moody's Investor Services, who's in charge of in, uh, assessing sovereign risk in many countries. I think you've worked in France as well, yes? We also have, remotely, we have uh, Francois Mallet, who's the Director General of Kepler Chevaux, which is a finance company. He's an asset management advisor. He's a market man. We have Sharon Donnery, who's the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. In Ireland, the uh, debt uh, PDB ratio has uh, gone to 125 to 160% in just, in just a few years. We have Laszlo Andor, who is the General Secretary of the European Foundation for Progressist Studies. He's an economist. He was a European Commissioner and uh, Barroso. He was in charge of employment. And his foundation is linked to the European Socialist Party. Before we hear from them, we're going to ask Jean-Pierre Paulin from the Circle of the Economist, who is an Emeritus Professor at the University of Orléans, who is going to launch our discussion. Yes, thank you, Pascal. Just a few figures. We know that over the last 15 years, the debt rates for all of the advanced countries has increased by 50%. It was a little bit, uh, a little bit more than 70% into 2007. At the end of this year, it will be a little bit above 120%, so 50% uh, rise. So you might think that is that is worrying, but in fact. When you look at the history of public debt and the diversity of uh, indebtedness rates today in Japan has more than 200 percent, whereas Germany is at uh, 70 or 80 percent, this is reassuring. Nobody has been able to prove that there is a limit to a debt rate which would have an impact or growth of the economy or which would lead to non-repayment of debts or debt cancellations. We can also reassure ourselves if we make a quick uh, calculation to see how we can stabilize debt. What do we need to stabilize debt today? Bearing in mind the rate conditions and the growth conditions. When we do these calculations that are quite simple, we realize that in these interest rate conditions and growth rate conditions, there is still margin for uh, deficit in the order of one, two, two or three percent. If we, we're looking at all of the advanced countries, we can go a little bit further. If you look at the uh, debt servicing, the burden of debt servicing in ratio as a ratio of uh, GDP, of national income, if you like. Today, in France and in the US and in most uh, G7 countries, this interest rate is at 1.5 percent. It's quite low. And it's lower than the rate which was in existence in the 1990s, which was about when well, it was about little more than 2 percent, before the increase in the debt rates that I've just mentioned. So here there is something that is, might seem surprising, but it's not mysterious. All of this is dependent on the relationship between the interest rate and the growth rate. And so it happens that the interest rates we're talking about are extraordinarily low. And of course, this is what explains this type of result. This is going to change. When the economies come back to normal, 
the interest rates will go back up and will become closer to the growth rate, which will limit the room for maneuver or the margin, as I mentioned earlier. Theoretically, in uh, equilibrium, the real interest rate has to be equal to the potential growth rate of the economy. That having been said, of course, to talk in concrete terms, when we get back to normal, the central banks will increase the interest rates, first of all because they're afraid of inflation and also due to a fear of financial instability. The conditions for remuneration of savings are perfectly abnormal at the moment and could cause problems. I won't go into that question in more detail now. So the danger of debt is going to emerge when we will have got back to normal. And we have some time left before that happens. It so happens that the average duration of public debt is 7 or 8 percent for the countries I'm talking about. Not you 7 or 8 years, not 7 or 8 percent. Yes, sorry. 7 or 8 years. So that means, provided that debt has not been completely renewed, we're going to continue benefiting from relatively low interest rates. Once this period is finished, then we will be faced with the well-known debt wall. What are the solutions we could imagine to deal with this situation? These solutions are very numerous and uh, are inspired by many different theories. As you know, probably we've had a debate about uh, the partitioning of uh, public debt, debt or the non-reimbursement of public debt held by central banks. I won't go into detail about those solutions. I just wanted to focus on two possible directions, which will be described in different ways and will be implemented in different ways, depending on the solution that is adopted. But I think that these two directions will structure the solutions that will be adopted. The first solution is a return to budgetary rigor. In other words, stability of public financing. Nobody's talking about that today because, of course, this would uh, call into question the economic recovery, which might be dangerous. But for a certain number of people, we'll not be able to do without a return to public financing, either through taxation, increasing taxes, or by reducing public expenditure. Although, if this is not done in the next two or three years, we have to bear this in mind. Some people are preparing for this, and we need to prepare how this is going to be put into place. The second solution is quite different. This consists in saying we're going to take advantage of this time we have available to try to position the advanced countries, the developed countries, if you like, the major economies, so that they have a, an additional growth rate, a higher growth rate. To do that, we're going to invest. And it so happens that the crisis has revealed needs for investment that are absolutely necessary, and also opportunities for profitability of investment that are quite considerable. This could be investment in the health sector, in education, in research and development, investments in infrastructure, and, of course, investments for the ecological transition. From that, we can expect to see an additional growth, which will give us more time to return to a balance in public uh, finance. And also, we can expect this additional growth to enable us to support higher interest rates. We need to come to your conclusion now, please. Thank you. Yes, in, to the extent that uh, the investments I've mentioned perhaps uh, are 
partly originate from the public sector, in other words, they uh, have to be the responsibility of governments, it's perfectly possible that this could give rise to deficits or additional public uh, expenditure and therefore deficits. So where is the problem if this, these investments are profitable and enable us to grow more quickly? This is part of, the, of today's debate. Whatever the case may be, regardless of the solution, assuming that we go one of these directions, we will have to revise the European budgetary rules, not only in, in terms of the figures, in other words, 60% or 3% extra additional or, uh, maximum of uh, public deficit, but also we have to look at the way these rules are defined. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Sarah Carlson, you uh, uh, give ranking to the debt. What is a debt that is dangerous? What does that mean? And you have perhaps changed your uh, ranking method with the current situation, which uh, is encouraging people to get into debt because the interest rates are very low and also so because we have very big needs for investment for the ecological transition. Over to you for five minutes, please. The, uh, and, and speak English to be as precise as possible. Parce que Sarah parle très bien français, elle ne vous le dit pas, mais on l'a entendu tout à l'heure. <laughs> she speaks very good uh, French, as you can see, and English as well. But, um, yeah, we rate over 140 countries around the world. We generally think about the creditworthiness of a country, which is essentially what you're asking me about along four lines. We think about the strength of the economy, that's how rich it is, how quickly it can grow, how competitive it is. Uh, we think about the strength of its institutions and governance. We think about the, the strength of the public finances. And you know, I often see questions, and I saw them in the description of this session, about what's the right metric to look at. Do you look at debt to GDP or do you look at interest payments? And my comment would be, why choose? Actually, we look at all of them. And we don't just look at uh, these metrics with GDP, it's the denominator. We look at it as re with revenues as the denominator as well. Because different countries have a very different political willingness and sometimes institutional capacity to, to raise revenues. And then we also look at susceptibility to event risks. And that can be banking risks, uh, political risks, uh, the risks of being locked out of the market, or traditional balance of payments risks. Um, but you know, when I think about where we are at this conjuncture in Europe and in advanced economies more generally, they've obviously most, many, but not all, have accumulated a lot more debt. But there's a bit of a balance there, and we tend to give these two things equal weighting. If you look at debt to revenues or debt to GDP, debt, as you've just heard, is at an extremely high level. But at the same time, this is somewhat mitigated uh, by the fact that interest payments are continuing to go down and countries have locked in those cheap rates for longer. But part of the question you asked me is about what level of debt becomes dangerous. And my answer to that is it depends. It depends not just on, uh, you know, on the, the numbers this, that you see in the public finances, but it also depends on how strong your economy is. A country that grows at a sustainably strong rate, a country that's highly competitive, and a country that is well run and well managed, has strong institutions, can sustain higher debt levels. And there are also some idiosyncratic things. I often get asked about the, the United States rating, which is still AAA stable. And yes, debt continues to increase. But the US also has some fairly unique features. The size of the economy, uh, the, uh, the depth of the US capital markets, the fact that the US Treasury. And the dollar. And the dollar is what I was going to end up with. If you, are, if you have the world's largest reserve currency, that is an important source of strength that doesn't fit neatly into any of those boxes, right? Le général de Gaulle disait c'est le privilège exorbitant des États-Unis. He said it's the exorbitant uh, privilege of the United States. That's what he called the uh, the dollar. So, I mean, just, just to wrap up. When I think about uh, sort of where where countries go next, I mean, ultimately, other than defaulting, which is not really in the cards for for any of the kinds of countries we're talking about. There are only four ways, mathematically, that a country can reduce its debt. You have, you know, it can inflate its way out. Now, in Europe, that seems pretty unlikely because of the credibility of the European Central Bank. Interest rates can help, but interest rates are already pretty low. 
frankly. And so it's not really clear how much more help they can give, fiscal consolidation or growth. And that's why what I wanted to finish with was how we're thinking about the rating trajectories of uh, advanced economies, especially those in Europe, and how we're thinking about the next Gen EU program. Because that, I mean, I'm also, the, I'm not just the analyst for France, I'm also the analyst for Italy. And when I talk about Italy with investors who call me every day, the way I talk about it is I say, this is a once in a generation opportunity for Italy that large sums of cash that can be spent on investment. It's also having particularly strong political leadership uh, that, has that has very strong credibility. But also, bear in mind the constitutional change in Italy. It, you're unlikely to get early elections because the, at the next election, the size of the Italian parliament it falls dramatically. And therefore, it, the incentives are really aligned to, to try to push something forward. But next gen EU isn't just about cash for investment. It's all the quid pro quo uh, for these cash disbursements is also structural macroeconomic reform. And that's something you didn't really mention when you were talking about growth. That's not just about investment, because quite frankly, you can put a lot of money into investment. Japan did that in its early attempts to try to stimulate the economy, but it paved over riverbeds. That wasn't, that wasn't growth positive investment. That was just investment that provided some short-term stimulus. But if in conjunction with productive investments and structural macroeconomic reforms, which are going to be watched closely by countries, European partners, as well as the Commission, that is the, the formula which at least gives countries their best shot at being able to have uh, some of the easier way of reducing debt, which is through growth, though I would expect that we would also see uh, some fiscal consolidation at some point as well. Okay, thank Thanks. you, Sarah. Uh, maintenant, on va se tourner vers nos... Now we're going to turn to our speakers who are joining us remotely. I'll hand over to François Marley, who is our market man from Declare Chevreux. One of the limits of debt, of course, is the market reaction and the market confidence. The question is, is that confidence rational or not? He's going to give us an answer. François, over to you. Yes, so the question is, is it rational or not? You underlined that trust or confidence is a very important aspect on financial markets, whether we're talking about debt or talking about uh, the share market. If you look at a simple example, if you as a private individual go to see bank and you want a loan, apart from the figures you're going to present to the bank and concerning the credibility of the investment that you're going to make, there is also a question of confidence that is established between you and your banker who is loaning you the money. So in fact, concerning debt and institutional investors, it's mainly the same thing. If they are confident and they trust you, we can estimate that the rates, and that's the key thing today, we can estimate that the rates will not remain for a certain period. This confidence in governments is based on what? It's based on, as you said, uh, based on the capacity of governments to invest, but to invest in the right way. What do we mean in the right way? It means they have to generate growth. We've just talked about Japan. Unfortunately, this was a failure. Today, we have to be careful. Governments must not use the current situation to be more interventionist and to pretend to be multi-sectoral specialists. This would lead to mistakes and to investments in projects that do not generate growth. But in any case, it's a very important point that this debt has to be used in the right way for investment, and of course, I won't go into detail there, uh, concerning functioning operating expenditure. We know in certain European governments this is much too high and would lead to more austerity. The second important thing for confidence is, of course, the role of the central banks. Up to today, we have never seen such coordination between the actions of central banks and, at the same time, the action of governments. And this is a very positive thing which contributes to confidence, which we are seeing today on the markets, and the confidence that investors can have in the debt held by the different governments. And here we're talking more specifically about Europe. The point I wanted to make is about debt cancellation. This is one of the subjects we are here to discuss. We might ask why should we cancel this debt? I think, first of all, I, can I just interrupt you? 
This is leading to a period of suspicion. If we uh, cancel the debt of uh, an investor is one thing, but we have to remember there are private individuals today who can today hold part of this debt. I think this is uh, particularly dangerous. There may be a uh, fear that some investors could uh, be losers in this uh, cancellation of debt. We have to be very careful when we cancel debt. I think this could create a uh, reaction of uh, suspicion. That's why I do not recommend a cancellation of debt. Finally, I would just like to make a point about the assets that are involved. If you have confidence, it's also because we know there are assets, major assets, that correspond to this debt apart from creating growth. And when you look at the policy of the different governments, we can see that some states have understood completely. I'm thinking of Asia and China, who recently, first of all, bought debt. And this helped them buy assets as well. When you were talking about raw materials for Africa, we can go about uh, commercial assets that are very important in Europe. And also we have the uh, assets in Portugal as well. And I think that is where there is a danger. We have to be careful that when we accumulate debt by these different investors, this must not lead to selling of assets, particularly strategic assets. And I'm asking, I would like to ask a question here. Is it not one way to limit debt and to be careful about this debt, which might increase very quickly? Might it not eventually be a way of uh, abandoning, uh, renouncing certain uh, assets? I'm not a specialist in that area, but I think that can be a danger in, in uh, cancellation of, uh, and losing certain assets. We're talking about a debt held by the European Bank. Uh, later on, we can uh, have another round of questions on that particular issue. Sharon Donnery, you're the uh, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Could you perhaps give us your Irish point of view? because your debt has changed quite a lot over the last few years since the crisis of 2008. And perhaps also give us some comments uh, on uh, looking in the longer term to try to see what is the best uh, ratio between uh, cost and benefit when talking about debt. Merci beaucoup. First, let me say that I'm very sorry uh, not to be uh, with you there. It would be uh, an extra pleasure to have uh, been able to visit with you, but maybe on, a, on another occasion. And maybe just before I speak about the Irish experience, let me pick up um, on, on two of the points that have been mentioned already uh, by the, the panel. Uh, just now, of course, Francois mentioned uh, the importance of monetary and fiscal interaction. And of course, I think wearing a, a central bank hat, this is really important to highlight, um, in particular for the Eurozone. And this has, of course, supported uh, the response uh, to this crisis uh, and we hope will minimise uh, the economic damage um, and particularly the potential for longer term scarring effects. So I think this has been important and, and you mentioned, uh, Pascal, of course, the previous crisis, um, in particularly in Ireland, where maybe we didn't have that level of monitoring fiscal interaction to support the challenges uh, that we were having at that time. And maybe going back to the very beginning, um, one thing that uh, I think is important also is that height um, can limit the room for manoeuvre in future downturns. So again, from a central banking perspective, something that's very important is thinking about resilience of economies into the future and some of the longer term challenges um, that can emerge. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but as you mentioned, maybe just to say a few words about Ireland. And um, of course, like all other economies, we have had this very significant fiscal response to the crisis. Um, and in our view of the central bank, that has been necessary and, and warranted. But we published our most recent, uh, most up-to-date forecasts uh, for the Irish economy just yesterday. Um, and one of our important messages in those was that we now need to begin to move towards much more sort of targeted policies to replace those initial very broad policies that we had at the beginning as a more sort of rapid response uh, to the pandemic. I think the other thing that's important from our point of view is that as support continues to be provided by government in this more targeted way, it needs to facilitate post-pandemic structural adjustments, so thinking about the things that need to change in the economy, whether that's about how we sort of live or work or travel, rather than uh, looking back at pre-pandemic norms. And now, of course, thinking about that, I suppose, uh, one of the big challenges um, 
in general, but particularly in Ireland, has been about whether the um, expenditure, the fiscal expenditure, has been temporary, just to deal with the pandemic, or also whether some elements of it have been more uh, permanent. And of course, to be really able to demonstrate um, if permanent expenditure increases um, are sustainable, uh, you need to be able to, I suppose, demonstrate also what's going to happen um, on the income side. I think it's also important to say that um, additional public expenditure, when it's being designed, needs to minimise um, inflationary pressures in areas uh, where there may be uh, labour shortages or, um, as many countries are experiencing, maybe raw material and other supply shortages at the moment. Um, and this also helps deal with uh, crowding out risks. Um, another significant area, I think, for consideration in Ireland, but in many other countries as well, is the unwinding of excess savings um, that have been accumulated during the pandemic. Um, and the unwinding of those savings could see uh, both the public and private sectors competing for scarce resources. So again, I think in terms of government expenditure going forward, uh, that unwinding of savings uh, needs to be taken into account in the sort of broader uh, policy context. Now, as was mentioned at the very beginning of the panel, of course, we also have the monetary policy uh, environment. And I think it's fair to say uh, that the monetary policy environment will normalise in time. Um, and then the higher debt levels may lead to this sort of increased investor scrutiny and the associated risk of a rise in sovereign bond yields. So you mentioned um, in your own opening remarks the Irish uh, public debt ratio, and it is likely to decrease as the economy recovers. Um, but I think it's really vital that the reduction uh, that we have in that de debt level provides us with sufficient scope um, so that we can respond to future uh, downturns. Um, and for us particularly, I think the pandemic response has shown the powerful effect that counter-cyclical fiscal policy can have, um, in contrast to maybe some of our experience in the past. Um, for us in Ireland, that's really important because we're a small and very globally connected economy, and we're very sensitive uh, to external developments in the wider global economy. And um, so some of the research that's been done by my own colleagues at the Central Bank of Ireland um, shows that Ireland is in fact uh, among the most vulnerable economies to both cyclical and structural changes in, in the global economy. So this basically means that we have in our, our economic cycle higher highs and lower lows uh, when you measure the various key economic indicators comparing this with other countries. And um, so it's really for that reason I suppose that I, I mentioned earlier the importance of this issue of building resilience in, in our economy in our, and in our public finances so that when the economy starts to recover, we also have the capacity to build uh, to respond to future shocks, uh, which I suppose um, are inevitable in terms of the ups and downs uh, of the economy. Um, and I think the pandemic actually highlighted really the importance of these sort of buffers um, or resilience um, that's necessary in economies, um, not just our own. Um, now, of course, many countries face these challenges as well, um, but one of the mentioned there are some of the longer term challenges and I think Sarah mentioned next generation EU and um, so of course one of the longer term challenges is the transition to a lower carbon free economy um, and I think we all know that's going to require substantial public investment and that's certainly high on the agenda at Ireland in Ireland um, at the moment. I think there are opportunities uh, for the public sector to sort of lead the way in the transition to that uh, carbon, uh, lower carbon or carbon free economy. Um, and expenditure and tax policies, if they're designed well, could really act as a catalyst uh, to help private investment for that climate transition and indeed uh, maybe even promote behavioural change that's needed um, to meet those targets into the future. And as I said, that's one of the things Sarah mentioned in terms of um, the next generation uh, EU package. But I think an important thing to think about when you're thinking about things like that is how we think about public expenditure performance. So how do we measure uh, the sort of quality and effectiveness of public expenditure and of course, in the past, uh, I suppose we've really looked at the cost of servicing the additional debt uh, versus uh, the return. Um, but that can give some perverse incentives in terms of looking at um, projects that maybe only temporarily boost economic growth rates. So one possible approach maybe to considering that is to give um, greater weight to the future when we're assessing the feasibility of uh, investments, government investments over the longer uh, time horizon, looking at maybe discount rates, cost-benefit analysis and so on so that we take into account a more realistic estimate of the future costs of present in action. Um, and I think there's important scope there in terms of green financing and green funds and ESG, uh, uh, the debate about ESG and thinking about that sort of framework for the future. Um, so I think, as you're hearing from the panel, judging the appropriate level of government debt is very challenging. There are many issues facing us um, and I think we need to, as I've just been saying, reconsider some of the traditional measures of evaluating the trade-offs of that additional debt so where you have expenditure on really clear, stated, measurable goals that uh, emphasise quality over quantity 
um, we're more likely to reap the benefits of that and then minimise the cost of having that additional government debt. Uh, now, of course, low interest rates at the moment do ease repayment uh, burdens, but of course uh, that may last. So I think a key issue from my perspective at the Central Bank of Ireland is having this sort of resilience um, from buffers to be in place. Uh, this was vital in the response to the pandemic and I think will be also vital in the future in dealing with some of the challenges that may be ahead uh, for the Irish economy. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Sharon. Voilà. Thank you. Uh, we end our round table with Les Laszlo. Sharon was saying that the states had to preserve their leeway, their margin of maneuver, because uh, uh, if there was a, another upturn, it would be a problem. But isn't the solution at the European level to recover uh, margins of maneuver in terms of the debt? Uh, we uh, let me also thank you for inviting me for this discussion. Um, I like the title, The Debt Danger, and um, uh, you don't need to explain to the Hungarian that debt can be danger. Uh, my country had about five debt crises in the last 40 uh, years, and before coming to the European level, let me just highlight three small lessons out of this 40-year experience with debt crisis. Number one, that the debt service ratio probably matters more than the debt to GDP ratio for most of the time, except, except when it doesn't. So I very much agree with uh, those who highlighted that several indicators need to be monitored um, in order to be able to uh, navigate, um, especially in case of smaller and open economies. On the other hand, for overall fragility and sustainability, it's not only the size of the public debt, but also the private debt that has to be factored in. Um, overlooking the private debt and its potential consequences on the public household was indeed a grave error before 2008 and also in previous uh, round. Uh, the third point I highlight is that the unorthodox solutions, for example, debt relief or debt cancellation, can be used sometimes. An example is that in 1991, uh, half of the Polish debt was, for example, uh, forgiven. But <coughs> these are indeed unorthodox uh, solutions. Uh, there is no way to make them uh, mainstream uh, solutions. So uh, somehow the entire system would need to be normalized uh, without uh, trying to rely on such exceptional uh, measures. But uh, Europe is not hungry, and I'm sure uh, this is a relief uh, for you uh, for many different reasons uh, today, but especially from the point of view of finance. Because what concerns Europe, the overall uh, 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 problem is not the size of the public debt, uh, but instead the problem is the lack of adequate financial structure at EU level. And this is what created the vulnerability in the previous round of the debt crisis about 10 years ago, and these problems uh, have not yet been solved. The joint issuance of public debt among EMU countries, as now piloted under the COVID-19 recession, actually helps reducing risks and enhance resilience. A very good example for this is an instrument which was launched last year, we call it SHORT, it's an EU instrument to support short-time work arrangements and it, it, it functions a kind, as a kind of anti-unemployment handbrake powered by borrowed money, collectively borrowed money. The point is that maybe separately, the EU countries would not have borrowed 100 billion euros to save uh, a few million jobs in the pand pandemic recession, but collectively they did it. And this did not undermine, but enhanced the resilience of the European economy. So there is an unused potential of the European Union if you look at it collectively. Uh, the big breakthrough, of course, is not short, but the next generation EU. On the other hand, the, despite the next generation EU, the fiscal stance of the Eurozone still risks being restricted from 2022 onwards, while at the same time we are facing a double task, on the one hand to make the recovery sustainable and on the other hand to implement a transformation to a greener, more sustainable economy. 
So if we are serious about transforming our economies and make them sustainable at the same time, we have no other option than to invest and to invest in a smart way. Due to the symmetrical recession triggered by the pandemic and the need to boost the green transition, the European Union needs to reconsider its investment capacity and consequently its borrowing capacity as well. For a sustainable recovery and the transition to the greener economic model, the old fiscal rules of the European Union have to be reformed or sidelined for a very long time. Or to put it slightly differently, the way to avoid sidelining the fiscal rules for a very long time is to reform them. And out of the set of the old rules, I think it's obvious that the debt ceiling is the one which appears to be the most out of touch with reality. And we need to ensure that no government wants to enforce it in the foreseeable future through any tools of the conventional fiscal austerity. It's a difficult issue since an arbitrary debt ceiling has achieved a kind of totemic importance in some countries. Most importantly, uh, Germany is uh, the country in question which has specific problems uh, with their own constitutional arrangements and which have to be addressed for having the freedom to pursue future-oriented economic policies. But also, more broadly, uh, unless the inherited so-called Maastricht model of the EMU is reformed and the investment capacity uh, of the EU is kept uh, so constrained, the European Union puts itself into a long-term competitive disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis the United States of America, Japan, but also others. And this competitive disadvantage is probably not something what our citizens want to see. In more general terms, not only about the debt, but also uh, the fiscal framework more broadly, um, I think it should be clear that the fiscal deficits are part of the solution in times of recession and may be instrumental for supporting productive investments in good times as well. For example, social infrastructure and human capital investment expands the potential GDP and should be considered priority. Besides, in times of crisis, the automatic fiscal stabilizers are the factors behind rising deficits and these automatic fiscal stabilizers um, have to be sustained and also partly moved to the European level to be uh, safer and more effective and uh, resilient. And the final point I wanted to bring here is that in the broader context for fiscal sustainability in the OECD countries, uh, we have to take into account uh, more issues than just public debt. For example, the new initiatives among the G7 countries, which now has to move to the G20 regarding uh, how to tackle tax uh, evasion through collective coordination of uh, tax policies, this may also play a very important role to protect uh, the tax base and keep the deficit as well as the debt Merci. under control. Thank you very much. Merci, Laszlo. Merci, Monsieur Andor. Euh, alors, j'aimerais rebondir sur le, la discussion ouverte tout à l'heure par François Mallet. Je vais revenir sur la discussion avec François Mallet. L'idée de canceller une partie de la dette qui est tenue par la Banque Centrale Européenne représente environ 25% de la dette européenne. Et ceci va permettre, according to those who defend the idea, to lower the ratio, uh, the debt uh, over GDP ratio, and to give more leeway. I know that Mr. Andor signed an, an economist petition in favor of this solution. I would like to ask uh, our other panel members uh, if someone wants to take the floor on this. Is that a solution? Can, can it be envisaged? Sarah. Sarah. Start. I mean, first of all, it's not something we think is particularly likely. Um, but also not convinced as to what it would actually achieve. Because if you look at, so we've been talking about the two dimensions of debt, right? So debt stock and interest cost. The interest cost actually cycles back to national treasury. So in terms of annual fiscal space, it really doesn't give countries much, if any more. 
As far as the debt stock number goes, I mean, if, if this debt were to be canceled, this raises a very real issue around uh, recapitalization of national central banks. Because it would, of course, they create... A, they don't need any uh, recapitalization. They can have a negative capital. Well, maybe. Central banks generally don't have negative capital indefinitely. They can. they can. There's no law that says that they can't, but we'll come on to, to the legal question in a minute. But uh, again, um, you know, if you have to recapitalize national central banks to maintain market confidence, for example, do you actually get much debt reduction out of that? And then there's also, you know, I've talked about institutions. Institu we talk a lot about institutions and governance at Moody's. They're incredibly important to the way that we think about all the entities that we write. And it, a cancellation of the debt would raise interesting and potentially difficult institutional questions about politicization of central bank decisions, uh, monetary financing of debt. And so this is not a straightforward solution. And again, it's something where when we've, when we've looked at it, we, we talked a little bit about it in our outlook for, for the euro area for 2021. It's not really clear what the benefits would be and some of the downside risks associated with it could actually be quite material. Okay. Est-ce que d'autres intervenants veulent réagir à cette Other people want to take the floor, Mr. Landor. Do you want to defend your position on that? Do you wish to add something, Mr. Politicization of the central bank is wrong. So that's why, for example, in 2011, it was wrong for the European Central Bank and other ones to interfere with policies they're not supposed to. So we have a very complex situation in the European Union. Uh, the key question is not the recapitalization of national banks in the euro area, but to create a room for investment in countries where it has been depressed for a very long time. So it's very important to put together uh, next to each other various options and choose the one which is the most forward-looking. Merci. Uh, thank you. Jean-Paul. Yeah, I have a, such a hard position on this uh, issue. I don't think it would serve no purpose whatsoever. Now, as it was said, today the states have the possibility to uh, to take um, to get into debt at negative rates for some of them. So, <laughs> negative rates. So, why would you want to cancel a debt that uh, precisely uh, uh, generates money for the moment? So, we must add that uh, if bank afterwards or central banks uh, at a later stage want to raise the interest rates, which will happen a day or another, well, for that, they will have to sell debt on the market, and they have to have a debt to sell it. So if you cancel the debt, I know how the central banks will be able to market debt, sell their debts, and increase and raise their interest rates. And then when the interest rates have risen, the banks, central banks that is, will lend at positive interest rates. And you must know that the revenues generated will give rise to profits on behalf of the uh, central banks, which on their side, and these, these profits are then redistribu redistributed to the states. And consequently, the states will lose the benefit, if in case of cancellation, of all that. So why try to cancel a debt when uh, debts roll, they are kept by the central banks and renewed on a permanent way, in a permanent fashion. And when the debts uh, uh, at the end of the cycle, they are renewed and give rise to, they're never reimbursed for them, they roll. And uh, if I calculate, in, as a small accountant, I try to calculate what uh, a debt that is never reimbursed is worth, I will say zero. So whether you cancel the debt with the risk of, <coughs> we know the risks, um, rather 
and enabling the states not to reimburse it while well, boils down to the same. So this has makes no sense, especially in the European scope framework. The countries of North have made a lot of effort. And why uh, uh, put a, another stone in their shoe uh, to make them accept a measure against which they will uh, go against. So let's take them further. And taking them further is to uh, enable them to f make the rule budget, European budgetary rules more flexible and debt rules that are absurd and that would be entitled to be revised to enable the states to make more debt, a little more debt, because there are a lot of investment opportunities. I will not go against what Francois Mallet said. It's true that there's not only the investment, the state investment, public investment that counts, but we need to be uh, also uh, uh, take a closer look at the uh, private investment. So there's a little time for a question. Is there a question from the room? Yes, this lady, madam, the microphone is coming. Maybe two questions. Five minutes. Uh, so first of all, thank you all. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I have a question on the. Oh, who are you addressing this question? For the last speaker, Jean Paul Paulin. Uh, so I don't see how we can hold the same discourse. On the one hand, we don't reimburse the date; doesn't matter, and the other positions, which is it's because there is debt that we will have to uh, adopt uh, austerity, uh, austerity measures and things. So how can we say on the one hand that debt is not a problem and you don't need to cancel it and then use the debt as a justification for austerity policies? I'm not saying that. That's not that's not what I say. On the contrary, I see. Let's not worry about the uh, level of the debt and let's go further than that. What is important is to allow the state, yeah, but obviously, to keep, as Sharon said earlier, we have to keep what we call a budgetary space, so leeway for the states to take a position in case of a, the next shock, which will have to happen, uh, which is is bound to happen, and the, what will the suits have to do to regulate everything. So but what is important, I think we shouldn't be too concerned about the debt, but keep this possibility for the state to continue to invest so as to stay on the path of growth, a higher growth path. The conclusion I wanted to make, yes, you have to conclude now. So listen, we're for 20 years now, or maybe 30 years even, we've been in the secular stagnation. We've used this expression, uh, secular stagnation, especially Summers used the, this uh, expression. There was a big debate to, uh, to know if a uh, very small growth that we've had, feeble growth that we've had since the 90s, it, does it come from a reduction of productivity gains, um, so uh, investment opportunities, but productivity gains, or does it stem from what Summer or Bernanke, the former head of the, the Fed, had called the sitting glut, the sitting glut, that is the excess of saving with a view to investment. So in both instances, well, we were daydreaming because the excess of savings. Can we say today that in the world there is an excess of savings? When I, I just unrolled just before all the investment opportunities that exist uh, from R&D to ecological transition. Yeah, but public investment is the private investment demand that, that is hurting. There is an excess of savings with a view to private um, in investments. But the public investment can take the place of the private investment. It's necessary because there's not enough private investment. That's the reason. Uh, 
And the other thesis that was uh, um, uh, supported by Gordon, whoever, his thesis was to say, contrary to what is said, with the third industrial revolution since the 1990s, we are faced with an industrial revolution that was meant to guarantee a new golden age of growth, when in the end, the productivity gain, except for the end of the 90s in the US and in the US only, not in Europe, and the productivity gain had never been so low, so weak. So computers, like uh, Solo said, are everywhere except in the st productivity statistics. Why? Because uh, there are questions of issues of uh, uh, allocating the savings to investment. When you invest in housing for real estate, you don't do productivity gain. Gordon develops this idea, but in any way, there is an absolute contradiction between this notion of secular stagnation and what we see, whether on the standpoint of investment opportunities, then on uh, gain, productivity gains. So let's stop with the secular stagnation. We need to invest, and it come, as, it show, as it comes, uh, public investments seem to be more important and m m greater than it was the case now. So we need to increase the public debt. This session is done, is closed. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have a very nice uh, festival in X.